Welcome, everybody. Uh, we were we were actually just lamenting uh, the lack of a, of a fall break, but nonetheless, we're very happy to be here uh, and and continue um, the lecture series at the Department of Architecture at the Weizmann School of Design for this semester uh, remote. My name is Daniel Barber. I'm I'm associate professor of architecture here at Penn and chair of the PhD program. Most of you know me. Um, just just for sure. And it's really a, a great pleasure tonight to welcome Ellie uh, Abrams to our virtual lecture series. Um, very excited to see her present uh, her work, which I've been following on various feeds and discussions and conferences and symposia, et cetera, publications, um, uh, exhibitions for a number of years now. And, and, and yeah, really looking forward to, uh, to see the show. Ellie Abrams is a, a licensed architect, uh, principal of, of TEAM. Uh, and Associate Professor of Architecture at the University of Michigan Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Uh, she was the, uh, the Taubman Fellow in 2009-2010. Uh, Ellie received her uh, MARC from the University of California, Los Angeles, and a BA in Art History and Gender Studies from New York University. Uh, she's held teaching appointments at UCLA, Princeton, and the University of Hong Kong and has been a fellow at the McDowell Colony and the Academy Schloss Solitude, which is one of my favorite uh, fellowship concepts ever, which I haven't oh, yet. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I have a couple of friends that have gone through there. And it's, it's <clears throat> the, the, you just go to this castle and, and have time to yourself, right? It's, yeah, it's, that's right. Sounds nice. Um, yeah. Uh, Ellie's work has been exhibited at, at, at lots of places, the, the Venice Biennale, Chicago Biennial, Storefront, a and Yale, Harvard, Princeton, the AA, and has published wildly as well. Ellie also serves as a commissioner on the planning commission for the city of Ann Arbor, an interesting, uh, anyway, maybe there's some interesting stories there. Anyway, yeah. welcome Ellie, we're really, really happy to have you here and, and look forward to the talk. I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and um, to the school for having me and to Ivy. Uh, helping me set everything up behind the scenes. Uh, I'm really grateful uh, and excited to be here with you. So uh, I wanted to just begin by acknowledging what an extraordinary time this is. Um, and instead of being able to join you in Philadelphia, I of course am zooming in uh, this evening and I'm coming to you from Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, where I work and teach and live. Uh, and Ann Arbor is the traditional home and land of uh, the Anishinaabe, Potawatomi, Fox, and Peoria people. And I imagine that many of you or some of you are scattered about maybe in different cities or even different time zones. Um, I think it's safe to say that for all of us, the past seven months have been a time of really deep reflection and reckoning. And uh, we have a heightened and necessary awareness of the precarity of our colleagues and our communities um, and the kind of structural inequities that really plague our society and our culture. Um, so I think it's necessary to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you kind of in this context in a time of incredible stress and global crisis. Uh, we have an impending election um, mere days away and that each of you is um, here this evening coming from your particular place. So I'm grateful that you're here. Uh, and I hope that you're doing okay. When I was first invited uh, to give this lecture, I was of course really excited to have the opportunity to share the work of my collaborative practice uh, team. Um, but when we got together and started to think about how we would structure a talk, it felt um, disingenuous, I'd say, to present the work as if we were in a kind of normal time, as if nothing exceptional was going on. And so as you'll see, the talk that we designed um, is one that tries to embrace the moment that we're in. So a moment defined by kind of constant logging in and streaming and broadcasting uh, mediated selves uh, out into the world and dealing with a kind of near constant exposure to our screens. And this means that the everyday environments that we're inhabiting are altered uh, and we thought that we would take advantage of that opportunity to kind of engage in a lecture format experiment together with you. Uh, 
I wanted to begin by sharing some ideas from earlier projects that are still at play in our current work. So this project that I'm standing here in front of was a competition entry called Arrange Life for a house in Los Angeles, located in the Hollywood Hills, not far from the Hollywood sign. Um, and you can see in this project that we're working with material qualities that show up in different ways. So in this project where the rock was our material muse, um, you can see that rock shows up as a kind of graphic profile. So the edge of the um, exterior wall behind me, or as image printed on the facade, or as form in fake rocks and real rocks, uh, which show up in various locations in the project. And this separation of image and form is something that our practice has been really working with from the very beginning. And the origins of that interest are in hybrid forms of representation that arose when we needed to merge one-to-one -one material prototypes with speculative design projects. And one of the tools that we used was photogrammetry. And this was a way that we could digitally process material tests and produce separate files for image, which would show up as a kind of texture map uh, from a rendering software and 3D form, which we would get as a um, polygonal mesh model. Here in the roof plan of this project, you can see how the image of rock shapes and profiles of rock and actual rocks merge to enclose a series of inhabitable spaces that accommodate living. Another ongoing interest that I wanted to highlight is the scenographic or what we often think about as placing images in space. So you can see in this project, the billboard quality of the facade, which was designed to resonate with the Hollywood sign just beyond the site. And we're really interested in the uh, play between the kind of two dimensionality of that image as a surface and the three dimensional objects uh, contained within it, which stage uh, a kind of backdrop for living and this play between the flat and the spatial. So this is another project called Living Picture from 2017. And this um, project, we produced an inhabitable image. So here, the thing which we're imaging um, as opposed to a kind of material texture is a borrowed scenography. So a digital recreation of a historic outdoor theater and constructing it as a three-dimensional physical space um, made up of these large-scale objects. So this diagram uh, that I'm standing in front of helps kind of unpack the process. So what we did is we made a digital reconstruction of the historic theater. Um, and you can see an image of that in the corner there. So the theater was designed in 1912 by the architect Howard Van Doren Shaw um, for his country estate uh, north of Chicago. And we used that digital rec reconstruction of the historic theater to produce a series of perspective views, which were rendered, you can see that here. We then took that series of views and projected those across a collection of three-dimensional shapes, which were arranged to produce a stage and seating for an outdoor performance space. And so this constructed rendering of sorts flickers between the resolved image of the historic theater and fragments of image that distort and break across objects in space. And it was our way of uh, kind of resituating the historic theater back into its original site, but through this um, kind of occupiable image. And you can move through it as you arrive for and experience uh, a series of musical and dance performances throughout the summer. And also uh, observe how the project blends with its physical environment on the site. So we've now moved to the interior of Arrange Life. So that was the uh, competition entry for the house in the Hollywood Hills that I began with. And you can see now that the billboard like exterior uh, produces or, or kind of on the interior reveals its structure and supports required to produce that outside surface. Um, and so this idea of the scenographic uh, extends to the interior where we see the backside, right? So we understand sonography to have a front and a back. And in the interior then, we try to set a scene that can accommodate its um, various activities for domestic life. 
Looking here at the plan, uh, you can see the interior organization of the house. Um, so instead of rooms with fixed program designations, uh, the house is conceived as a loose staging of domestic activities supported by a range of objects, furnitures, surface, and of course, these backdrops that set the stage. Uh, so for example, behind me here, you can see uh, the kitchen. So we of course use this term loosely when we were working on the project. And for us, the kitchen isn't so much a designated room with kind of fixed program or fixed objects and, and architectural elements, but it's more a space of accumulation, um, a kind of provisional space where objects and tools related to cooking might um, accumulate. And this way, different modes of inhabitation and living can unfold over time. So this project from 2018 is called Additional Address. And here we were continuing to think about domestic interiors, but this project is a design for an ADU, um, an accessory dwelling unit. So a much more modest scale of living space than the previous one. And I'm here, uh, here uh, in front of the model for this project. So in this one, um, we spatialized images to increase the sense of scale within the interior and also to address the close quarters of the primary residence on the site. So we were uh, continuing to pursue a kind of act active scenography that revealed its construction and the houses, um, the spaces of the house you can see in this isometric drawing unfold around this totem in the middle, which is a storage space uh, with exposed substructure and exposed kind of layered construction. Uh, and in this isometric, you can begin to see how image pulls landscape into the interior of the ADU, producing an artificial horizon that extends the space and makes it feel much larger than it is. So in this project, the idea of materializing images began to merge with another interest in uh, cheap building materials. And so it's what we in the kind of around the office colloquially referred to as the Menards theory. So Menards is a regional uh, Midwestern big box hardware store. And uh, if you wander the aisles of Menards, you can find a myriad of building products printed with images of materials, often stone or rock or masonry. Uh, it they come in all different sizes uh, and in all different categories. And for us, we see a latent aesthetic project in these kinds of uh, commercially available building products where um, there's a certain, I think, humor that we can read into it, but they also have this earnest quality um, where they're trying hard to look like something that they're not, but they're also not trying that hard. Uh, so this is um, the ADU, but now in a kind of new instantiation. So what began as a speculative project evolved into a built one. And I'm now standing inside uh, the ADU, which is currently under construction, estimated to be complete in, uh, in a few months, hopefully uh, by, by the new year. And so with the reality of um, built construction came some new design considerations. So um, we're kind of continuing an interest in the image of materials and also marrying that with this kind of interest in affordable construction. So given that the ADU shares a site with the existing house and uh, due to some local zoning ordinances, the mass of the ADU has to be attached to the main house. So you can see here the way in which it extends off the garage to the back. Um, and this massing negotiates the necessity of connection uh, and sharing while also trying to produce a separate identity for the building. And you can see that the entrance is along the side, which gives it some privacy, and it has a series of large windows to the back um, where it has views to um, a wooded area, and that the massing kind of scoots itself to the rear of the site to kind of get out of the way um, of the primary residence. And so in that way, the project um, is is site specific, let's say, but we also see it as a kind of prototype for affordable construction. Uh, and so this is a photograph of the project a few months ago under construction. 
Um, and one of the ways in which we're trying to get a more affordable building cost is by using factory-based construction. So in this instance, uh, the ADU is made from SIPs, which um, allow us to have a kind of precision on site and shorten the time of construction on site. One other strategy that we are trying to employ to minimize on-site work is the use of this insulated slab on grade foundation system. Um, and so this minimizes excavation. It eliminates the need for a crawl space or a basement that's typically required in cold weather climates like Michigan uh, and reduces the waste of traditional formwork, um, reduces the need for heavy machinery on site, um, and also reduces time of construction. On the outside of the ADU, there's a series of material planes that wrap volumes and slip over one another. There are a few types of cladding. So there's a galvalume metal roof, which wraps down and folds around to kind of cap the volumes. Uh, the sips are coated in a liquid applied vapor barrier and then wrapped either in a stainless steel mesh or uh, an open joint fiber cement panel. So in terms of image, the focus in this project shifts from images of nature like rocks or plants that you saw in previous projects to thinking about the image of building materials like OSB or concrete. Um, and when possible, we try to use the construction system to produce the finished surface on the interior. And so, um, the material becomes or is the kind of image of itself and produces um, its own uh, kind of finished surface. So for instance, uh, I'm standing here on this concrete floor. Um, so that's a result of doing this insulated slab on grade foundation system. Or for the walls and the ceilings and the interior structure when possible, um, we reveal the OSB or the LSL uh, columns and joists uh, and also exposed joist hangers and exposed, exposed hardware. So the project is currently under construction. Not all of the surfaces that you see in these images will remain exposed, um, but many of them will. Uh, so this thinking about affordable construction is something that we believe can have impacts at a much larger scale, or ideally would have impacts at a much larger scale, uh, at an urban scale. So when it comes to diversifying housing options and um, making well-designed homes that are more attainable to more people, um, this is an avenue that we're kind of actively researching. So the buildings here around me are um, a series of buildings which are uh, for a current project that we're working on in Detroit for multifamily housing. And we're working systematically to produce several low to mid-rise housing types that range from a duplex up to a 16 unit mixed use type. And all of the buildings derive from the same logic of construction that we're using. So um, like many cities uh, in North America, the costs of construction in Detroit are quite high due to uh, expensive land costs, um, expensive trades, and expensive materials. And so um, we're trying to figure out a way that we can bring down those costs and still uh, deliver a nice space for living. So there's the insulated slab on grade um, foundation that I mentioned. In this project, we're also working with a prefabricated composite panel wall and roof system. And similar to the ADU, uh, trying to, when possible, avoid extra finishes. And so using the building systems as the finish when possible. And this approach, I think, affords certain design opportunities. So for example, because the prefabricated wall and roof panels are affordable and also very well insulated, it gives us the ability to actually create a lot more exterior surface than you would typically find in a low budget construction project. So the kind of necessity for compactness um, finds a little bit of relief and the massing then can get broken down to create um, a, a, a series of smaller masses that sit on top of a base essentially. So um, in this project then we also can um, take advantage of that to produce exterior circulation. 
So what you see in the section here are um, these two-story kind of lofted units that sit on top of uh, garden level units. And the um, smaller footprint of the loft unit makes space for this exterior circulation uh, on the second floor. And um, it's kind of interesting just in this moment to think about the way in which this design has inadvertently um, turned out to be really pandemic friendly. So there are no, there's no shared lobby or shared doorknobs or um, surfaces actually that you have to touch. So you can kind of enter uh, without touching anything uh, straight to your front door. Um, and so the project represents really a convergence of a desire for affordability, sustainability, uh, and what we think will be a really nice place to live. So um, the kind of well insulated shell provides low energy use. The um, broken up massing allows for a lot of cross ventilation and just a high amount of ventilation and daylighting uh, in the units. And the buildings will be fully electric electrified. So there's no natural gas hookup coming here. Um, and, and we hope we'll provide uh, new high quality workforce housing for this neighborhood. Uh, and so the way that we think about approaching affordability is not about reducing architecture to some kind of minimum product for housing, but really thinking about design as a series of trade-offs. So how can we redistribute the budget to place value where it matters for quality of living? Um, and so this has been a really interesting and um, exciting conversation about these kinds of priorities and opportunities, both within the office and also with the entire project team. Uh, so I'm standing here in front of uh, a mixed use 16 unit building uh, and you can see the open space on the ground. So the units each have their own kind of private patio space. Uh, and behind me, you can see the exterior circulation that leads to the second floor um, and um, the way in which that stair kind of creates a connection between these two levels um, and a sense of community kind of internal to the, to the building. And this is a view of that second floor exterior circulation space, uh, which we think of as a kind of elevated street. So all of the entrances to the second floor units face um, or empty out into this street. And then there's a couple of stoops which lead uh, to private stairs up to, to third floor units. And the buildings are thought of as really prototype buildings for a future larger scale development. And the ambition here is to think about how we might work higher density into what are traditionally single family home neighborhoods. So as I mentioned, this project is uh, located in Detroit. So Detroit is a really dispersed city. It, it evolved and was planned around the automobile. Um, and so creating this kind of density that we imagine could produce uh, a kind of walkable neighborhood requires us to work around or push back on some zoning restrictions that overwhelmingly privilege single family housing. So things like um, minimum lot sizes, which are very big, or uh, minimum parking requirements, which we think are too stringent, large setbacks, which um, are too big, <laughs> et cetera. And so um, those ordinances, I think, are, you know, uh, in need of an update, let's say, because they often run counter to the ambition to produce this kind of dense walkability in the urban context. Uh, and so we've spent quite a bit of time thinking about how we might work around that. And um, so the, the, the kind of desire to produce that density and to rethink the kind of housing that one might um, offer in neighborhoods which have historically been primarily single family home neighborhoods uh, necessitates just thinking about new housing types. And so uh, there's a lot of talk these days about the missing middle. That's a term that, that we hear more and more, which has emerged as an approach to inserting denser housing into these single family areas uh, and meant to be a transition between the detached house uh, and a large apartment building. Um, and so it's not, you know, um, an issue in many of, 
of uh, the densest cities in the United States. But if you look more broadly at the country and you look at mid-sized cities and small cities, 75% um, of the residential land area in our country is zoned for single family. And we know now that there's um, a close connection between this kind of zoning and uh, an overt desire to limit access to housing uh, for certain communities, uh, primarily people of color. Um, and so I think the missing middle offers a model. Um, we think of it as a way to try to counteract that history. Um, but we also, I think, identify a bit of conservatism in the, the aesthetics or the design that often comes out of projects um, working in that, in that scale. And they often attempt to kind of simulate the look of a single family home. Um, and so we're interested in, you know, Kind of thinking about that as a model, but really thinking about the possibility um, looking forward of new types, which might break that mold and incorporate a range of unit types, a range of income levels, um, and offer the attainable housing at below market rent. So this project, which is called Ghost Box, um, is a, a much more speculative one, but also a project that is attempting to reimagine a building type. Uh, so in this case, um, the big box store. Uh, so a type that's becoming obsolete under kind of current economic circumstances. And this project was designed for the 2017 Chicago Architecture Biennial. And for it, we reimagined or we imagined the reoccupation of an abandoned big box store for residential use and a reassembly of its materials to make new spaces for living. So the big box retail store is a persistent figure uh, in the suburban landscape. And it's a spatial model that comes out of a certain um, economic one or business one, but there's also a real material specificity to its construction. And that's something that we uh, explicitly wanted to draw from in this proposal. So uh, in this um, large scale model and kind of speculative design proposal, we um, imagined that you would selectively disassemble this existing big box store and reassemble its parts to enable other occupations. So as I mentioned, these kind of spaces for domestic life. Um, this is another project that involved uh, uh, us kind of spending a lot of time thinking about a new future for a disused building type. So this project is the Detroit Reassembly Plant, uh, designed in 2016 for the U.S. Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. And here we were asked to think about a speculative design proposal for um, the abandoned Packard Automotive Plant in Detroit. So a very large um, complex of multiple factory buildings made of reinforced concrete and brick. And similar to the big box, this building represents a failing type that remains embedded in the city uh, as a ruin. And the project proposed redistributing its physical matter to create alter alternate uses and a new image of that disused materiality. And so the goal or the kind of vision or ambition for the project was to shift um, the image of that disused, the kind of association of the, with the image of that disused materiality from one of blight and liability to something new and maybe something um, more future oriented. And so we imagine that the factory would be, the site of this kind of former factory would be come an active site of collection, sorting, um, collection and sorting of waste materials. And then those materials would then get cast into new buildings. So this is an image of the physical model that we produced um, for the exhibition. And you can see how materials are being reassembled into different forms. So this is uh, an image of what was a public gallery space contained within this lightweight, uh, semi-translucent cast in place shell. Or here, um, what we kind of affectionately 
referred to as the mountain, um, this kind of heavy monolithic form made from recycled brick and concrete recovered from uh, some of the rubble and piles of materiality from the site. And this new aggregate gets formed into these large um, precast blocks, which are then craned into place. Uh, or here where the existing column beam and slab structure, this reinforced concrete structure um, of the original, one of the original buildings is maintained and sheathed or um, enclosed in reflective materials that actively produce new images of the site's materiality. So returning here to ghost box, um, this image of the model shows the part of the project that we uh, did as an homage to the practice of James Wines and Allison Skye called Site. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, projects of theirs from the 1970s and 80s, uh, where the signage for um, best department store uh, showed up like this in their projects. And so we appropriated that design here with our practice name, um, partly because the kind of charge from the curators for the biennial exhibition was to think about a contemporary relationship to history and to think about the role of precedent in architecture today. Um, and also because, um, you know, it was a way for us to kind of pay tribute to a practice that has uh, had a lot of influence on, on our work. And so it was a little bit cheeky, um, but it also in this project in general was a, a real test for design ideas that we're currently working on um, in, a, in a new project. So uh, for this project, we are asked uh, by a client to renovate an old commercial space for new retail and community, uh, community um, oriented nonprofit organization. And so uh, the building behind me, or the image you see here is the way in which the building looks today. Um, there used to be a large billboard on top, which was removed, unfortunately, um, by the advertising company that owned it. But you'll see that we're interested in kind of bringing that back to life. Um, and the facade is currently being used uh, for a series of kind of public artworks. Uh, and the, the building interior and the roof are in really terrible shape. And so rather than rebuild those um, kind of as they were or where they were, what we're proposing is inserting a new building into the shell of the old building, kind of shifting the new interior um, over to a side lot and producing this space in between the two. And so we are afforded then an opportunity to call out an explicit difference between the old and the new. Um, think about those two things adjacent to each other. And that allows us to reframe or represent qualities of the existing building, such as the brick detailing um, and the big framed openings in a new way. Uh, so here you can see kind of looking down into the courtyard that gets produced as we um, shift the new building uh, back and away from the existing shell. Uh, and so you get a kind of building inside a building um, with an interior courtyard framed within the exterior brick walls of the original structure, which of course need to get braced uh, by new support um, and by the new building itself. Um, and here you can see how we're starting to think about bringing the billboard back to life, uh, but thinking about the billboard uh, not only as a moment of sonography, um, as a physical image in space, but thinking about it as something which is occupiable and um, could offer new vantage points in the site. Thinking about surfacing the ground for play, um, an eating area for walk-up food service. So starting to try to fold together these different programs uh, as a way of activating this courtyard space uh, between the new and the old. And that idea of subtraction that can yield new possibilities, you know, comes kind of um, in a lineage, let's say, with the ghost box, pro ghost box project, where we were also thinking about the way in which subtraction can actually produce space. Um, so we're now back at back in the ghost box model, but we're on the other side. So. Um, the other side of the model reveals uh, a cut 
a kind of section cut to the interior. And um, in order to think, or like in order to inhabit the inside of this building, which was originally designed according to a certain model of efficiency, a kind of ruthless efficiency, um, we use scenographic elements that help recode and reframe uh, what's left behind after the partial disassembly. So uh, there's printed imagery, which hangs as a backdrop um, and establishes a new horizon that seems to ex expand and extend the space in some directions. Um, we also use image as a way to produce interior partition. So we have these um, walls, which have a kind of mountainous profile printed with images, which are uh, high resolution photographs of physical material tests that we did in the office. And they create these kind of layers of visual or, or visual series of visual layers that break down the interior into smaller scales. Oh, can you see me? Um, so in place of efficiency then, um, as a kind of ruthless efficiency I was just speaking of, there's variation and change within the space. So the layering of scenographic elements has just enough specificity to begin to suggest certain modes of occupation, um, but we're maintaining a provisionality. So a capacity for new scenes to take shape over time. And this open-ended quality is something that's um, intentional and that we really kind of strive for in the project. Um, and we're, again, of course, continuing an interest in reassembly. So an ongoing strategy that our practice experiments with, uh, which is tied to these visual effects. Um, and so we also have a longstanding interest in material reuse and mater thinking about material life cycles. So um, here you can see some of the material prototypes that we developed for the Detroit reassembly plant project. And um, here we're, re we're uh, harvesting materials from the site and recombining them and casting them into new forms and thinking about how those new forms retain many of the original kind of qualities and textures of their um, material source, but also produce a new image of that material. Um, and here was an opportunity for us to test at full scale some of the ideas that we were developing um, in the model for Detroit reassembly plant. So this is a project called Clastic Order, um, and it's a full scale prototype um, where waste plastics and building materials like concrete and brick and glass are combined and recast um, or reconstituted into this monolithic column. Uh, and so we were interested in, in this project um, in the kind of physical byproducts of demolition and the um, waste materials that come out of building construction and thinking about casting new form uh, from that waste material. Uh, and then at a vastly different scale, um, you know, we build a lot of models, uh, or we have in the office um, historically in our practice. And we think about those models as small scale constructions. So they become um, sites for material experimentation, uh, where we can, uh, to a certain degree, test certain kind of tectonic <laughs> assemblies, but also really test the aesthetics of working with found materiality at scale. So this project was called, um, which is, is a design for an exhibition, uh, we called it Models on View. It was put together in 2019 for the gallery at the Architecture School at Kent State. And um, for this exhibition, we had planned on exhibiting some of these models that I've been showing you. So the ghost box model, um, the Detroit reassembly plant model. These are very large models, uh, anywhere from eight to 10 feet long and, and four to seven feet wide. And uh, we found out kind of partway through the, the design that the door to the gallery, um, which is here behind me, is actually 
significantly narrower than the model's smallest dimensions. And so we had to come up with a new plan for the exhibition. And what we ended up doing was building large scale dioramas of our projects to create uh, uh, kind of scenes or um, uh, like a kind of stenography within the gallery. And so uh, they're meant to be viewed from outside. You couldn't come into the gallery. And they were staged as, as if they were um, kind of a set of models being moved into the gallery. So they showed up um, in crates uh, or they showed up as images on monitors. Um, and then of course these dioramas. And maybe what's hard to kind of do justice to um, in the image is that uh, what you're seeing there is a is a photograph of a gallery storefront, but that what appears in the photograph is a composite between uh, a kind of rendered image printed on window vinyl, um, a three dimensional diorama that you're getting a view into, um, and photographs which are um, backlit to appear like screens. And I think rather than maintaining the illusion, you know, as um, the, the, the point of the project really was to reveal the apparatus behind image making. So you can see here uh, the softbox lights and the props and kind of structures which are needed to hold up these blankets which are printed with images of our models. Um, and so even though you couldn't come into the gallery, you could walk up to the window and you could peer in and you could see this uh, kind of behind the scenes. And, you know, a value of ours would be is that these things don't resolve into a kind of perfect view, um, but that the uh, orientation and, and stenography and staging of, of objects and images is such that it provides multiple views. Um, and, you know, a kind of almost perverse mediation of our own work by representing image and representing material uh, that had begun already as images of materials in their first instantiation. So we're in this kind of cycling through of the, of the image and of the materiality. And this project um, seems like a nice one to end on because of the way in which it does pull back this curtain uh, and it pulls back the the layers of imagery and um, streams of information that we really, you know, kind of resonate, let's say, with our current moment where we are all in this kind of virtual space, um, producing mediated images of ourselves and kind of impressions of reality. And so beyond the specifics of this exhibition or how it presents our work, um, we thought it would be a nice place to end because it kind of suggests a way of seeing that we think is of the utmost importance in this moment right now. So what we were hoping to do this evening is, um, you know, begin to pull back the layers of mediation that we've been um, kind of forced to inhabit these past few months. And I think what you see when you pull back the curtain is that um, the past, you know, six, seven months have been a real emotional and logistical struggle. And so I think it has not been a time of virtuosic production. And that wasn't the impression that we wanted to leave you with, because we think it's important right now to uh, you know, cut ourselves some slack and give ourselves a break. Um, I think all of us, including you, um, uh, have been going through a lot. Um, Ishan, can you swipe the image? So I think what's also often hidden behind the apparatus of self-presentation uh, are the many networks of support um, that we all need and all deserve, whether those are institutional or financial um, or health related. Let's see here. Hold on, I have to fix the video. Um, Ishan, can you spotlight my video? So, um, you know, and I think um, we all have these structures of support that we want to acknowledge. So there's many people, um, I think, responsible for the work that you're seeing tonight. Um, 
a lot of people to thank. So Tom and Adam um, and Meredith, who are the T and the A and the M in team. Um, and uh, of course, all of the past and present employees and collaborators and research assistants and students uh, that go into to producing this work. Um, and uh, one last important thank you uh, is to Ishan Paul, who have been behind the scenes um, as the kind of media DJ making uh, the kind of occupation of the image that you've seen this evening possible. Uh, so I wanted to uh, give him a special thanks. So I hope you enjoyed the talk uh, and seeing a little bit of our work and I look forward to uh, answering some questions with you. Fabulous. <clears throat> Thank you so much. It, it, it felt uh, less like a talk and more like a really a kind of experience, right? I mean, it was that yeah, was really <laughs> quite a nice way to to get us to get a sense of the work and, and how you guys work and what your what your priorities are. I have a couple of yeah. questions, but I, I always want to let it let it go out to the students first. So if anybody wants to jump in, I think we're using the Q and A function. Um, you can put questions in the in there, um, or or certainly can. You know, I can read them out, um, and I think we can also. You can also just sort of uh, find a way. Uh, chat in the chat, or we don't have the hand raising, but in the chat, just let us know, and we can we can um, unmute you and allow you to to enter the discussion. Um, I'll, I'll I'll start um, uh, again. Thank you so much. It was really a, a great a great. Um, body of material and a really nice way to walk through it quite literally right um I, and i was i was just i was just struck um and you know of course this is uh, i guess something of some of my own obsessions as well but the you the especially at the end there the the term and the kind of thinking about the work is scenographic right and and i'm also a, a lover of, of james wines um and, and that sort of moment um, when the, and even you know when the scenographic kind of hit the ground or quite literally you know I mean and his work starts to crumble and you're kind of seeing its strength I and mean, just as you're revealing there. But I was struck by in, in a lot of your projects you know throughout and just the kind of even the uh, some of the first things you were showing the, the kind of earthiness for lack of a better word right or the kind of dirtness and kind of rawness and 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 you know which is to say it's not just any scene and it's not just any material but it's this kind of um earth right i mean it has this real sense of, of any end and i love that you know that i mean i don't even want to call it a table for the model right the, the kind of uh, uh, um, sculpture itself of that kind of excavated sense right and so i don't know if you can just speak at all to to that sort of aspect of the work and and why that sort of presence of of the earth itself seems seems to be of uh, of some value. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. It's a great one, um, and it's one that actually I don't think I've ever been asked directly before, but is um, one that <laughs> it seems so but no, but seems so kind of like such an astute reading. I think um, largely, and and I guess something that has evolved over time. Um, I think largely in the beginning, the result or that kind of earthiness, as you're calling it. Um, is a result of the fact that we were working with uh, found piles of building material, building debris, mm. and you quickly realize that concrete, brick, I mean, they have this kind of of the earth quality. Um, and so when you have a pile of broken bricks, right, or you're beginning to kind of grind up brick and concrete um, and cast that into new form, you get this real, I think, kind of connection and a kind of um, like a, a natural rustication, right? That that mm, that, mm. that occurs. Um, and I think we, from the beginning, were interested in um, like the associations, cultural, historical, that materials carry, and the um, kind of narratives that accompany them. I mean, not in any kind of romantic phenomenological sense, but really more in like a um a, an aesthetic territory that we could mine uh and try mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. like re-image or uh produce a new association with that materiality but we valued keep maintaining some connection to its source so when you look at the um detroit reassembly plant and you look at that big like megalith kind of or monolithic kind of mountain made out of chunks 
you can kind of read that the brick that it, that there's brick in there or that there's concrete in there. Um, so it hasn't been like totally obliterated, which I think in some material reuse, some veins of material reuse, they're unrecognizable, right, as their original thing. Right, right, um, right, right. And so I think that connection was important for us. Um, so I think that's, yeah, and I would say now the, the current work, I mean, as we're moving into more built, built mm -hmm. projects away from speculative work, I would say that that kind of earthiness has, or the, the kind of rockness has become woodness <laughs> because <laughs> the way in which um, contemporary building materials and kind of construction technologies often lend themselves to wood and the image of wood in a way. Right, um, right, right, so right, right. texture, wood textures and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, interesting, fascinating. Um, anybody want to jump in? I have more, but I, I want to, I want to again give give people an opportunity. Um, can 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 you say more about that transition to built work and 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 the sort of you know the challenges there are the I mean obviously opportunities as well, but I don't know if that's because that seems to be I mean you started in a way I mean the the well early in the the, the um, I'm forgetting the acronym now, ADU, right? Yeah, house. Um, yeah, exactly. Right, and then and then um, coming back, coming back around to to the, the community center. Yeah, how how has that transition been, and has it changed the dynamic of the team or sort of the way you're working? Mm -hmm. Um, it's been a good transition. I mean, I think it's something that we're ex really excited about. Um, and but it has. Um, actually been interesting, I think, to see the way in which <clears throat> even in the really kind of speculative or experimental work, which was always intended for an exhibition audience, um, mm. there were the seeds of ideas that we could, car could carry into built work. Um, and I think from the beginning, we were committed to, even in the models, thinking about um, thinking about them not only as kind of like scaled representations of a proposal, but actually scaled constructions. Uh, and so like for the Detroit reassembly plant model, we actually tried, I mean, to the best that we could, we tried to kind of fabricate the model the way in which we imagined one could fabricate this thing at full scale. Um, or for the ghost box model, which was the kind of rocky tabletop that you were referring to for, mm -hmm, for Chicago, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, being really faithful to the way in which that big box door had been constructed and the parts uh, from which it was assembled so that when we disassembled them and reconfigured them, there was some kind of faithfulness to that. And so, I think that that attention, let's say, to the kind of way in which things are constructed, even if it's at a model scale, right, you know, right, has right, allowed right. us to think about these ideas as they scale up. And and of course, mm. there are new pressures on the work, which I think we welcome and are interesting, but the kind of right, contingencies right. of right. real the real world. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Um, good, good. Oh, oh, we have a question. Okay. See if you, you give them time. Um, uh, okay, this is from, yeah, I suppose you can probably see it too, but uh, 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 Ellie, but I'll go ahead and read it out so everyone can can hear. Um, from Troy uh, uh, Reisenen, uh, apologies if I'm getting that pronunciation wrong. Uh, I, I enjoy the way you work with models and representation. It reads to me like serious play. Uh, you hinted uh, to the way these models inform your understanding of materiality. Can you discuss what you have learned about scale and translation as you explore the literal literal work as it relates to material? Did you, did you get that last? The, there was yeah, I'm, a... I'm also leaning in with my old eyes <laughs> trying to reread it on the screen. Um, so Troy, yeah, I assume yeah. that you are, you mean maybe a similar question to Daniel's that as we move into full scale building, um, the way in which we are kind of relating to material now. Um, so you can correct me in the in the Q&A or the chat if I misunderstand your question. Um, so, you know, I think um, I briefly mentioned this thing like the Menards theory uh, in the talk, which was this, I you know, kind of interesting intersection we were 
observing between um, the way in which we had been thinking about the image of material in these like wild and kind of experimental projects and the way in which um, off the shelf uh, construction or building products, kind of catalogs of building products often feature the same or similar aesthetic. There's a kind of funny aesthetic overlap here. Um, and for us, it became an opportunity to think about <clears throat> uh, the image of material, not simply as uh, kind of, um, not simply as play, not simply as a kind of, not that I wanna, I don't want to take that back because play is good, but not simply as a kind of experiment, but also maybe as a strategy for affordable construction. And that if we could have, if we could kind of marry those those two things, like this aesthetic interest in um, image of material and a kind of formal interest in sonography and uh, a desire to think about, you know, three dimensional experience and the way in which two D and three D things arranged in space produce particular experience. Uh, if we could marry that with kind of affordable construction, we might be able to kind of really find an interesting space within which we could work. And I would say, um, check back in with us in like a year and we'll tell you how it's going. Cause we're kind of right at this, um, you know, uh, precipice, I would say, where we're starting to work on these built projects, which are either under construction or breaking ground in a few months. Um, and it's really exciting and, and we'll see kind of how these um, experiments begin to play out at full scale. Um, but that's, yeah, that's kind of the way that we're thinking about things at the moment. Great, and so then there's a, a, a second question um, with, the, with a sort of apology uh, that, that the work itself of course is fascinating, but some curiosity about uh, the, the talk and its, and its uh, presentation. Could you talk about the process you went through, the team went through to execute the format in which you decided to deliver the lecture? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the way that you went about it, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would love to, and no apologies necessary. I mean, the the, <laughs> the, the structure of the talk is kind of begging uh, for somebody to ask about it. So, um, I mean, as I mentioned in the beginning, if, uh, if you were here at the beginning, it just, it seemed, on the one hand, it felt like a missed opportunity to just like, have everybody join for a Zoom and just kind of page through some slides um, and be a little, you know, be a little bust um, for all of you that is talking. And so it just felt like very, um, it felt more appropriate to maybe two things. One, take advantage of the kind of hyper mediation that we're all immersed in and think about a way in which we could show our work um, through that format and uh, not try to like use an old, you know, use a kind of lecture hall format on the screen, but use a screen, a, a screen format for the screen. Uh, I think the other thing is that we really wanted to do this. <laughs> like we, we wanted to make sure that at, there was a moment when you understood um, the reality. Like I'm in, I'm in my bedroom. I have a piece of green fabric behind me, you know, and a ring light and because, um, I think kind of culturally in our discipline and in our field and in academia, I think we have this, um, you know, an almost pathology about kind of virtuosic production and um, about uh, kind of achievement. And I think, you know, that that's just not the moment that we're in. I think many of us, including uh, myself and my and my teammates are, are struggling day to day. Like it's a tough time. And so, um, you know, I think we wanted to like kind of offer that. Um, I don't know if you're asking maybe about the te technical <laughs> aspects of how the presentation works, but it's basically a green screen. The software is called OBS. It's a free software. Um, and Ishan Paul, who I uh, thanked at the end um, is really behind the scenes. Uh, essentially imagine a video version of, of Photoshop where you can layer in things live and stream them, yeah. Yeah, great. Well, no, and it is, I mean, it was really nicely effective to even just the kind of, I don't know, just sense of a person in space, right? That we, I mean, it, it, it's, um, it, was, it was effective to me, not only because of the, 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 the production itself, but also of course, given your subject matter, that kind of recognition of how the person in space kind of shifts the relationship to materiality and form and all of these, 
all mm -hmm. the issues that you're that you're putting forward, right? It was, uh, I mean, it was quite. But I don't know. I mean, I almost I did get this kind of, yeah, like how, how it's been so long, you know, since I've, <laughs> I've seen an actual person standing up in a lecture hall and giving a talk. You know, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's one starting to lament a little. I don't know. Yeah, um, I mean, it's also. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting experience to kind of inhabit the images that we produce, which is not mm. something I've done before. <laughs> um, and right, so when right, we when right. we designed this talk and started kind of inhabiting our work, it's like a different relationship right. to one's own work, which would be, I don't know, could be a curious thing to do, not necessarily for an audience, but just as right. um, part of one's own design process. I mean, do you have a sense, I, I don't know if this is really a fair question and feel free to deflect or something, but, and, and how how this 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 mediated experience and and some of the other pressures indeed as well of this you know the pandemic might be having an impact on your your work as as an individual or your sort of interests and inclinations or or maybe how the how the four of you are operating together in any way or i mean i don't know do you see this do you see the any kind of major impacts and do you see things lasting or changing no no prophecies needed but <laughs> I mean, I see change happening everywhere. I hope some yeah, of it is last yeah. lasting and I hope some of it is temporary, right? I mean, I think, right, right. Um, you know, speaking now from like a very personal position, so not as team, but just as Ellie, as myself, I mean, I think, um, you know, the way in which I occupy, the way in which I kind of am in the world, I think has really changed. Um, mm. And that's, you know, uh, I think a good thing. Um, I think there's been, you know, a, a shift in a little bit of a shift in priorities and in the, yeah. the kinds of things that I'm paying attention to. Yeah. And I yeah. sense that that's a broad, more, you know, a broad condition. Um, and I think, I think that the kind of reckoning that I mentioned at the beginning that I think we're all going through is a necessary one. And so, um, I think in uh, undoubtedly that will change the work. You know, not so I don't know yet how, but I think it will. Right, right. I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, as educators, so, you know, you're, we're professors and I'm, this lecture is hosted by the university. Like, I mean, higher education, I think, has fundamentally changed in ways we probably don't yeah. understand yet. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 No, good, good. And, and I, I mean, you know, I, I think that I, I guess I really appreciate the way in which the practice, um, uh, has this way of sort of revealing itself that your your you know the the, the four of you uh, and the work that you've been producing has a way of sort of revealing its process in a way or kind of its its uh, its preoccupations and in, in, in ways that are very uh, I don't know easy to easy to connect to and easy to kind of get get a clear sense of it's it's a really refreshing uh, body of work. Um, thank you, Ellie, for joining us. Uh, thank you for taking thank the time for and. Uh, thanks for the questions and for everyone for uh, for for joining in. Um, we'll we'll see. I hope a lot of you uh, next time. And um, yeah, thanks again. I hope to see you uh, see you soon on a review or uh, somewhere on the screen, no doubt. But uh, yeah, maybe somebody off as well. So I'm sure our paths will cross. Thank you so much. Good. It's been okay. A pleasure. Thank you so Bye. much, Ellie. Take care.